I have spoken way too much about this book. I've lost all perspective on what's interesting or not. We will ruthlessly inform you. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh... <laughs> oh, I've, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. So you're a critic, huh? Mm. <laughs> I'll show you critic. <laughs> not anymore. Yeah. No. Now now you're an essayist. Oh, God. <laughs> He's a flaneur. Mm. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Douthat. I'm Carlos Lozada. And I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion. I want to welcome Ross back from his spring break gallivanting around with the family. Welcome, Ross. Hi, Ross. Did everybody have a good time? Yes. No, it was great. Um, I'm still suffering from reentry problems, but I'm sure they won't manifest in any way, shape, or form. We'll be gentle, and, and you can wait until after we're done here to uh, show me all the pretty souvenirs you brought me. So. I, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I brought you nothing but pasta. You're so good to me. Perfect. But on to today's topic. Now, Matter of Opinion fans may have noticed that Carlos reads a lot, and not just the collected works of Jimmy Carter. <laughs> he reads Supreme Court rulings, commission reports. God love him a ton of political memoirs. Better you than me. That's what everyone says. Mm, but now he has his own book out. He writes, too. Uh. <laughs> he doesn't just read. He writes. It's incredible. Yes, Carlos has just published a new book called The Washington Book. And it is his case for why we should all be reading these kinds of things. So today, he's going to try to convince us to care about these documents. <laughs> and after we grill him, we'll go around and share what texts have shaped our understanding of politics, too. So to get us started, Carlos, my friend, state your case. Why should we read Washington? So the one thing people almost always say to me when they realize that this is, in fact, how I make a living is some variation on what Lydia said. You know, thank you for reading all that so we don't have to. Like, I'm yes. to be commended for discharging some painful public service. Exactly. But I am and have long been a believer in Washington books. I find them enormously useful for my work as a journalist. And that's because even when politicians present themselves in sort of the most benign or favorable light, they still find ways to reveal themselves. It could be something Obama said to his personal aide on a campaign plane, something Vladimir Putin said in an essay like 25 years ago. I love finding those little details and holding them up to the light and holding them to account. Um, I don't say it's the perfect way uh, to understand Washington. It is my way to understand Washington. When I sit down to read a political book, I'm skimming it as fast as I can, mining it for you're giving, the parts. You're giving it, I think you, you call that the Washington read, right? Right, like, it's the Washington <laughs> read. Yes. But it, never do I sit down and go, by God, I cannot wait to tear into the acknowledgements for <laughs> footnote number 75. I don't understand how you do, how you even have time to read those things. Like when you sit down with a stack of like eight books. Well, when when you get paid to do it, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the thing that everyone says to you. Better you than me reading all these political books. I'm curious how you feel about that line, because it seems to me reading reading and rereading in some cases these essays, there's there's a pretty sharp distinction between how you talk about a lot of official documents or semi-official documents I'm thinking about everything from Supreme Court decisions to, you know, the January 6th or 9-11 reports, these sort of products of committees or official governmental statements, and how you talk about books by politicians. And reading it, it seems like you might say that there are certain documents that come out of Washington that all Americans should read that are worth reading. I'm not sure that you feel the same way about the political memoirs that you read. I feel like in that case, it's more like you are doing us all a favor by finding interesting things in them. Like, everyone should not read Kamala Harris and Ron DeSantis's memoirs, right? Mm. It's better to have a Carlos Lozada so finding the interesting thing in them, but they aren't fully worth it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you actually would endorse that view. I hadn't thought about that distinction that you raise. You know, I've thought about 
memoirs and I've thought about official documents, but I hadn't thought if there was like a clear through line into how I treat them. I largely agree with what you're saying. I do think that things like the 9-11 Commission report, the January 6th committee, the Kerner Commission report from the late 60s about sort of the racial unrest in America at the time, those are vital documents that tell us so much about American history and help us understand the place. And I do wish those would be more widely read. I don't think everyone needs to read So Help Me God by Mike Pence. Um, but that said, I, I do think that there's a lot of utility and at least being curious enough to read what someone else says about Mike Pence's book. You know, maybe if you care deeply about the Trump presidency or about the events of January 6th, you might be interested in what some of the people who dealt with that day in particular have to say. You know, Liz Cheney's memoir touches a lot on that. Cassidy Hutchinson's memoir. There's a bunch. And so, you know, if, if you care about a certain topic, I, I think it makes sense to jump into that. Now, the reason that I think I might treat those differently is that the sort of personal memoirs of of politicians often give you insight into the character of a person. And they give you insight into what that person thinks of you. They reveal how they see the audience they're trying to persuade of something. But those other documents, the 9-11 Commission Report and all the others, they reveal something about the character of the nation. And ultimately, I think that's a more important thing to focus on. I really enjoyed so many of these. And I read a lot of these pieces as they came out, um, but revisiting them sort of grouped in this way was really fun. One of the things that really struck me was there's clearly a line between kind of a delicious gotcha, like I unearthed something that is a bit of hypocrisy or self-regard or whatever. And there's some of that uh, in one of your essays titled The Self-Referential Presidency of Barack Obama. I thought, oh, you know, is he being a little unfair to Obama? Like, don't all presidents use their biography as a way to kind of illuminate? But the essay ends up actually going somewhere deeper. So I'd love to hear about that tension between, like, these sort of delightful gotcha moments and, like, when you know that you've unearthed something deeper and more profound than just this person is a hypocrite or mm -hmm. they said something and they, they didn't really mean it or whatever. Thank you for seizing on that particular piece. That one took me on and off about a year to write. I was writing other things, but I was kind of thinking about it for a long, long time. I knew I wanted to to pop it sort of when Obama was, was leaving office. But I'll tell you the origin story of that. I was reading and reviewing a different book. I was reading Michael Eric Dyson's book, The Black Presidency. And I came upon just one line. Michael Eric Dyson writes a lot on, on race and politics. Um, and he said that, you know, Obama lauded the racial progress that he had witnessed, quote, in my own life, substituting his body for our black bodies, his life for ours, and signaled that, again, how his story of advancement was ours. And I have here my original copy of the Michael Eric Dyson book. And I wrote in the notes, he always does that hmm. about everything. I wrote in the margins. And then I wrote parentheses, Fodder for bigger essay? Question mark and, <laughs> and 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 close it right. And then I forgot right. And then well, I just we're set really it aside. getting the inside dope, here. you know. Like so I like, love but, the process. But I'm saying it's like it can be like one random line and something else you read that suddenly just like unveils everything. And it was that moment when I realized Obama does this about not just race in America. He does it about you know using his biography to explain how he'll fix sort of relations with the Muslim world or why. He cares about America's founding documents because when he was little, his mom would wake him up to read them to him when they were living in Indonesia, you know, and it hit me that you could understand Obama through this lens. You're right that all presidents use biography to illuminate their message. What was remarkable to me about Obama is that the message and the biography were the same thing. There was that time during the transition to his presidency when people were complaining that you're just hiring a bunch of like Clinton era retreads, like where's the hope and change? And he was like, I'm the change. Right? I alone. I'm the message. You know? I alone. And, I alone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, is, it is a more benign version of I alone can fix it. He was the change we were waiting for, not we were the change we were waiting for. And so sometimes that happens when I'm sort of trying to get my arms around a subject and I find like one way that just captures it for me. Okay, so 
There are some of these that it just feels like you had more fun writing than others. And we brought up poor Mike Pence. I have to say I was impressed by the viciousness with which you took him apart. It just felt like you had some demons to work out there and that it was probably a whole lot of fun to write. Am I wrong? Um, Be honest. It's like I never I never I don't derive like more pleasure from writing something negative than writing something positive really? about about a book. <laughs> mm. That's no, I, I think that I'm where I derive the most pleasure is from sort of revealing something useful about a book, something you can take away that then you can interpret how you want. With Pence, there were a couple of things that people seized on in that piece. One is that, you know, he spent a lot of time on January 6th, where he famously did not move to decertify the election. You know, he went contrary to what Trump was encouraging him to do, even when people were calling out, you know, hang Mike Pence. And he quotes Trump's video message from that day when Trump finally called on the rioters to leave the Capitol. And he says that Trump said something like, you know, I know you're hurting. I know your pain, dot, dot, dot. There's an ellipsis there. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. Trump did say all those things. But I remember when I read it, I wondered, like, what did Pence skip over? What was caught in that little ellipsis? So I went to the video, you know, thank God for C-SPAN. And (laughs) in between there, Trump had doubled down on the lie of the election. He's like, you know, this was a landslide election. We won. It was stolen from us. Everyone knows it. Pence skipped that part. Mm -hmm. So even on a day when Trump did nothing to protect him or to help him, he was still kind of covering for the boss. And I found that I found that remarkable. You know, to, to me, so much of that vice presidency was captured in those three little dots of Pence's ellipsis. Now, I have to assume that as you read all of these things, they then sit there and help you process the new stuff that comes out. Like that, there was a lot of talk about Trump on the stump last weekend, talking about there would be a bloodbath if he lost. And and then there was all this discussion about, you know, what were this, the context of this? Mm-hmm. and I'm guessing that from your extensive readings on Trump and the way he presents himself, which I think was your previous book, right? I mean, you had a you you did a lot yes. of Trump reading yes. that that you have a lot of uh, material in which to contextualize. Yeah, I, w- I would love to hear what you all think of that incident as well, Ross. If you were blissfully unaware of it oh, during, no, no. during I, your vacation, I, even, um, even in Italy, even in Italy, <laughs> made it all the way blood, to Rome. How do you say you bloodbath cannot, in Italian? Cannot. I mean, I was in the Colosseum at the time, you know. So, oh, yeah. so perfect. So I, I was I was fascinated by the bloodbath controversy because I think it captures not just a lot about how Trump speaks and operates, but of how people respond to him and interpret him. So he gave a speech in Ohio over the weekend and he was talking about how he would impose big tariffs on, you know, cars manufactured outside the United States when they enter the country. And he said that that's if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath. Until that moment, it seemed plausible that, yeah, he's mainly talking about the auto industry. Then he went on to say, that's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. The stages of interpreting a 30 second Trump clip are vast. <laughs> when I first saw it on social media, I thought like I, I just saw that if I don't get elected, there'll be a bloodbath. And I think like, oh, he's calling for political violence. Right. Then I see a fuller clip and I think, oh, maybe he's just talking about the auto industry. But then I actually sit down and read the words and try to parse the language. And I see that I honestly don't really exactly know what he means in that moment. The words are kind of a mess. That's frustrating for me because I try to be as precise as I can in interpreting texts and speeches. Trump makes that kind of hard. But so how do I end up processing that in the moment? One way is to look back on the things he said before. And from his rally in 2016, when he was, remember, offering to pay the legal fees for anyone who, like, got rough with Popped somebody at a rally with, with, with protesters to right now when he's promising to pardon the heroes of January 6th who stormed the Capitol, you know, after he told them to fight like hell to save the country. His rhetoric around political violence has been permissive. So I can hear that clip and be worried. I can hear it also and plausibly interpret it as like a media freakout especially when there's far more unambiguous material that he mm-hmm. has said along those kinds of lines. The last thing I'll say about it, and this this gets to the things that, that you see in, in sort of books about Trump that have tried to kind of explore his rhetoric, and that is that he has a tendency to move back and forth from the controversies that he creates. And so I, this is, I hate to make predictions, as you know, but I would not be shocked 
if now that bloodbath has entered the bloodstream, <laughs> if he would at some point down the line kind of embrace some version of it, his um, of, of being open to his, you know, his supporters who just feel very strongly about things, you know, engaging in acts that that he seems to be distancing himself from now. Well, I mean, he did give an inauguration speech that described the state of the country as American carnage. He's an upbeat guy. I don't know. I, I think to put this in Lozadan terms, <laughs> the question that Trump raises for your approach to analyzing American politics is a difficult one because so much of your reading assumes not just that words matter, but that even when politicians are writing books that are self-serving and effectively propaganda and so on, that there is a core there that you, the discerning reader, can get to and learn something. And it's not clear to me that it's always true in general. I think reading you persuades me that it is true more often than one might think. But I think with someone like Trump, whose whole thing is the gaseous ramble joined to the real estate developer's pitch where words are really just there to sell and you have no personal commitment to them. You'll abandon them if criticized. You'll double down on them if it seems advantageous. Isn't that sort of a particular challenge for your kind of analysis that like there is no real meaning of certain Trump lines that people obsess over? It's all contingent and provisional and, you know. It's like he's scatting. Yeah. No, but he, he like, deeply believes things, right? Like, there are some very, very consistent through lines of things that he believes and has talked about. I mean, I, I share Ross's perspective that, yes, he does present challenges to your method of analysis, but there is a kind of remarkable consistency um, in some things that Donald Trump believes and has spoken about over the years. Yeah, I'm a little, I, I absolutely um agree that that Trump presents challenges to textual reading. There's no there. I mean, you know, I I don't know how easy it is to be an an originalist when you're looking at Donald Trump trying to understand what he actually (laughs) believes from day one. I worry a little bit about sort of concluding that, well, therefore, his words don't really matter because they mean something to different audiences and different audiences act on them. That's why I think it's actually vital to continue interrogating those words. But sometimes it's not even the word. Sometimes it's the inflection. I'll give you one example that has like stayed in my head, you know, forever from the January 6th committee report. And that is, you may remember Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. She was this young aide in the Trump White House, and she was there on January 6th and observed a lot of things firsthand. And she's describing the moment when Trump is about to give his big speech at the ellipse outside the White House. And he's upset because there's these metal detectors there and they're not letting people through because some of them were armed. And so he starts yelling, like, take the magnetometers away, let my people in. And he says, they're not here to hurt me. That's the quote. They're not here to hurt me. And of course, the moment you look at that sentence, you wonder what word did he emphasize? There's two very different ways to read that sentence. If he said, they're not here to hurt me, right? If it's hurt, then it's kind of benign. It could mean, you know, they're not here to hurt me. They're here to cheer me or support me. If he said, they're not here to hurt me, it's a far more sinister sentiment, right? They're here to hurt somebody else. I don't know which one it is. And it was driving me crazy. So then I went back to see how Cassidy Hutchinson said it in her video testimony. And for her, it was kind of neutral, maybe a slight emphasis on the more benign interpretation. But like you can have a running transcript of a moment and still not be sure what someone means. There's an ambiguity to text, to history that is inherent. And that can be a source of frustration, but it's also just reality. And so- That's the level of granular parsing, Carlos, that does make me fear for your sanity in the long (laughs) run. No, but 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 don't you see how it matters? I do. I absolutely do. Well, and there's a way, and this is where I would plug your earlier book, Carlos, which was less about Trump than about all the ways that people wrote about Trump, right? Is that this sort of instability in Trump's own persona, the extent to which People can't agree if he's sincere or he's a salesman or both and so on, has then played out in these endless iterations of interpretation. Part of the value of reading all these 
books, as Carlos does for us, right, is that you can understand the effect that Trump has had on our society only by seeing not just what he himself has said and done, but just sort of the endless hall of mirrors and so on that goes outward from his own rhetoric. Which is really the sign of a great demagogue. Well, and I, I, you know, I think a sign that we should all be grateful that Carlos takes him both literally and seriously. Oh, um, I see what so. you did there. <laughs> nice. Well done. Okay, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to get a little more personal. Thank you for um, taking so much time with this book. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted nothing more than to have some smart critics kind of pick it apart and tell me what I'm really saying and what I really think. But now I actually want to um, turn it around on you. You guys always kind of mock me for bringing up books and (laughs) quoting reports and Jimmy Carter memoirs. And so I want to know what are the books or texts that have shaped the way you understand American politics. All right. I'm jumping in here first because I have exactly one. And if somebody else claims it, then I got nothing. (laughs) But I have one book that I return to just randomly. It's not on a particular topic. It's not like I'm doing a piece on Joe Biden and need to go back to the 16 biographies or whatever. It is The Woman at the Washington Zoo. Ah, yes. See, I knew it. By the late, great Marjorie Williams, who was a writer for Vanity Fair and The Washington Post. And she was the master of the political profile. She could take anyone and make them interesting. One of her best ones was on Dick Darman, George H.W. Bush's director of the Office of Management and Budget. Like, God, I love that oh so much. Oh, my God. Can mm. you think of anything mm. more tiresome? I love that so much. <laughs> but it was a brilliant profile. So tasty. So tasty. I never looked at Barbara Bush the same after <laughs> I read Marjorie Williams. Like, And the other thing she could do is she could take something in public life and mix it with something from private life and kind of fold them together in a way that few people can do. So, like, I remember one piece she did when Washington had snipers. There were these, you know, two guys riding around the suburbs of Washington. You probably remember this, Carlos. Oh, yeah. Just picking people off. And she was trying to explain to her children at the time why it was so scary. And this happened to be when she was dying of liver cancer. Mm. And so she kind of folded in the whole concept of randomness, why life's randomness is just so terrifying for people. And I actually have tattoos on my arms um, that say time and chance, which is a quote from Ecclesiastes, you know, time and chance happened to them all. But it also was like the last line in this piece that Marjorie wrote, which was just kind of heartbreaking and spot on. And so anytime I'm stuck wondering, like, why the hell do I do this for a living? I get this book out and remember, oh, because it can be done this brilliantly, even if I can never, ever approach this. <laughs> there is a kind of Washington journalist that's very knowing and canny and, and frankly, cynical about Washington and its personalities. And you can use these sort of fireworks writing in that mode. But there always felt like something true and authentic and real about her approach. And I think the very sad coda to it, of course, was that she died far too young. Way too young. But she wrote the most amazing essay as she was dying. And I I just I just looked it up because this line has never never left me the image. She's writing about anticipating death, and she said, Sometimes early on, death was a great dark lozenge that sat bittersweet on my tongue for hours at a time, and I savored the things I'd avoid forever. Yeah. And it's just this, I don't know, the image of this lozenge and you know Death as a lozenge. Yeah, that's amazing. Um so just an extraordinary, extraordinary writer. That's a great choice, Michelle. I'm rethinking everything now. And I love that it's an essay collection, right? Those yes, those are I did not make that clear. Yeah. Like and and, you know, there's As all the best books are right. clearly. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. OK, Lydia, what's your pick? 
You know, it's funny. I um, One of your essays, Carlos, is about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and reading de Tocqueville mm. just as you were becoming a, a U.S. citizen rather rather late in the game, I think you... you, you, you <laughs> yes, 10 years ago. Just, just in time for the 2016 election. <laughs> 2016 was the first election I voted in, yes. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I, I almost chose Tocqueville as my choice because I was born in the United States but spent a lot of my childhood outside of it. And uh, I read... Um, Democracy in American College, and I think it served a lot of the same purpose for me as it did for you as a as an outsider. And oh, that's great! But I did not choose uh, Tocqueville, as it turns <laughs> out. I actually chose a different book that is not even ostensibly a book about politics, and it's also not a book about the United States. But you know, if the question was a book that has influenced how you think about politics and democracy and all these kinds of things. I think the book that has probably influenced me the most is Tony Judd's book, Postwar, which is about Europe from 1945 to essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, you know, the rise of European Union and all that kind of stuff. And the thing that I love about this book is it's not a kind of grand theory of history and like how things unfold. It's really a book about agency and about how the things that human beings do and the choices that we make are actually what history is all about. But it's also a book that's about memory and forgetting getting how, you know, after the horrors of World War II, you both had to forget what people did to one another, but then also figure out how to come together in order to move on. And then at the same time, build a whole culture out of the memories of what happened. So I think as an American, uh, for me, I think a lot about our history and the ways in which, you know, memory and forgetting work in our politics. So this all sounds very abstract, but this is the book that I think has, has had the greatest influence on me as, as a writer and a thinker, particularly in this job as a, as a columnist. So, um, yeah, post-war, Tony Jett. All right, Ross, you're up. Uh, I guess I, I'm going to recommend a genre rather than a specific Ooh. book, mm. because I think in parallel to the Lazadan approach to politics, where you are looking at either the official work of Washington and the sort of inner lives or pseudo inner lives of politicians, there's the question of how the great and good and terrible American public makes Washington do whatever it does, that there's an extent to which history is made by the choices of Mike Pence and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and John Roberts. But there's also a sense in which all of those figures are constrained in their decision making, channeled and pushed in their decision making by changes in the body politic. So the kind of books I have in mind are books like, to take two examples that sort of bookend each other, Kevin Phillips' The Emerging Republican Majority, written around the Nixon era and the emergence of the modern Nixon to Reagan Republican coalition. And then John Judas and Rudy Teixeira's The Emerging Democratic Majority, written in the early 2000s, describing the Obama coalition that was then taking shape. And of course, what's interesting about those examples is that both are describing changes in American life, but then are also sort of influencing politicians' choices, right? Republicans could read the emerging Republican majority and try and pursue the strategies that Phillips sketched out. And similarly, many Democrats read the emerging Democratic majority, and it influenced their choices. I think in certain ways, our colleague Tom Edsel wrote a book called Chain Reaction about the transformation around race and crime and taxes in American politics. David Frum wrote a couple of books uh, a long time ago, one called Dead Right about the arc of conservatism after Reagan, oh, one about the I'm, 1970s. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, cheating. I'm, I'm going on too long. I'm just saying. Didn't somebody write something called The Grand New Party about the need for a different kind of Republican? <laughs> That's enjoy? a different podcast. Yeah, that, that I mean, I, that, that out of the books I've written, that was the one that was sort of trying to sit inside that genre. And, it, and in a way, it describes certain trends, I think, quite presciently about how the Republican Party had already been transformed and was going to be transformed. But then it totally failed to <laughs> anticipate the actual form that this would take, which was Donald John Trump. But I think that genre is a really important complement to the kind of writing that yeah. Carlos does about official Washington. I, I love all these suggestions. Um, I think that's especially interesting at a moment when the country feels very, very split. And the notion of a massive realignment, while seductive, is is sometimes hard to to fathom. If I can cheat, I'm just going to say that mm -hmm. um, 
one book from the last decade or so that for me has been sort of formative and memorable is a book called The Speechwriter by Barton Swaim. Mm-hmm. Swaim was the speechwriter to Mark Sanford uh, when he was governor of South Carolina, including during the famous moment when Mark Sanford disappeared for a few days and claimed he was hiking the Appalachian Trail, but in fact, he was with his girlfriend in Argentina. It's a wonderful book about political rhetoric. And Swain reaches a really interesting conclusion about this idea that politicians are always lying. He says, one hears very few proper lies in politics. Using vague, slippery, or just meaningless language is not the same as lying. It's not intended to deceive so much as to preserve options, buy time, distance oneself from others, or just to sound like you're saying something instead of nothing. To me, that that line, to sound like you're saying something instead of nothing, captures so much about political life. And I think that's why I try to parse their words and write about their books. If the art of politics is to drain meaning from language, right, to produce more and more words that say less and less, then I think it's a fine mission to try to scoop that meaning back up and try to jam it back in. So anyway, that's what I'm trying to do in general. And I love that I can hash it out with you guys. All right. Well, with that, everybody now has their reading list. Go get you copies of all these books. Uh, starting with the Washington book, of course. <laughs> uh, available wherever books are sold. Wherever books are sold. And even some find... places where they are And even aren't. when they're not. Even when they're not. <laughs> like right here in my office. Yeah. That's right. You can stop by Carlos's office and pick yourself up a signed copy. But when we come back from the break, we're going to get hot and cold. All right, guys, it's time to get hot and cold. But first, oh, my God, Lydia, your couch segment from last (laughs) week really hit home. (laughs) Listeners sent in dozens of links to help you find the non-boring couch (laughs) of your dreams. Please tell me that they provided some inspiration. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got so many great suggestions, discovered like (laughs) new local furniture stores in Mm. like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And but as it turns out, um, I I happened to be in the Berkshires over the weekend and we stumbled upon a little antique store um, and they had a an amazing couch that that I bought that is actually older than I am um, oh, and um, does not look like a couch that anybody else has. <laughs> I realized when I was looking, I was like, I want a couch that looks like it'd be in like the office of like a very cool old psychoanalyst. And, uh, and that's exactly what I found. <laughs> well, I expect to be invited over for drinks on it soonest. That sounds fantastic. Absolutely. Okay, now pressing on, who has a fresh hot cold for us this week? I guess it's me because I was away. So I have to bring back tidings. Your punishment. Um, and my my tidings, this is maybe the most banal and predictable statement. But so we, we were in Italy. We were in Rome. We took our kids to Europe over the summer. So we've been to London, Amsterdam, Paris, and Rome with our family in the last year, which is not a normal pattern, just to be clear. Wow. Fancy. And I'm going to say. a lot say, of airline miles. I'm going to say firmly mm-hmm. that, uh, that Rome is the best. And all listeners, all Parisian, <laughs> Dutch, and English listeners, I, I apologize. But it really is the case that the scale of history, the different layers of history in Rome is without, I think, without peer, even among the other great European capitals. And so I, I guess I'm I'm hot on on Rome. Well, wow. it's hard to argue with that. And I believe I believe that one of my co-hosts, one of our co-hosts here is actually about to decamp for Italy. Absolutely. Doing doing the family trip. And so I would have been very bummed if you had... If I'd been cold on Rome. Cold on yep. Rome. Yep. <laughs> Italy's so the least interesting country so in boring, Europe. So boring, so uh, boring. Actually, I did a walk at night to a dinner with, you know, some key Vatican insiders. <laughs> not, not, not really, but I did take a long walk through the city at night alone. And, you know, I walked past the spot where supposedly uh, Caesar was killed which is sort of a semi-excavated ruin. Mm. And they have a couple of what are called umbrella pines planted at the spot. And there was something about, you know, it's midnight in Rome and you're walking past these sort of shadowy trees where 2,000 years ago 
the dictator was stabbed to death by Brutus and Cassius. And, you know, it's just, it's it's hard to beat. Um, it also freaked me out a little bit, but it's hard to beat. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I will be eager to hear Carlos's trip notes as well. But until then, I'll see you guys later. Take care. Right. Great Have to be great back. great trip, Carlos. Thank you. Congrats on the book. See you soon. See you soon. Bye, guys. Matter of Opinion is produced by Phoebe Lett, Sophia Alvarez-Boyd, and Derek Arthur. It's edited by Jordana Hochman. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Afim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. 